Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thank you again to our Patreon subscribers. I know I say this every time, but we do really, really appreciate your support. So for those of you who haven't heard, our Patreon is less than the cost of those new holiday cookie cutters that you know you bought. You can hear us talk about more interesting engineering failures that don't quite make it onto our regular Failureology episodes. That's $5 Canadian per month, which is less than four US dollars or four euro because the Canadian dollar is not great. And our mini failures are released on opposite Sundays from our regular episodes. So as one of our patron members, you get an episode from us every week. You get to hear about more interesting engineering failures. You get to hear all of the cool train tangents that we go on. We're doing a series over there about different environmental failures that have occurred. And they're just really fun episodes to put together. If you're curious about them, but not sure if there's an episode on there you want to hear about, go check out uh, the exclusive content page on our website at failureology.ca. And there's a list of all of the mini failures we've covered so far. And speaking of those holiday cookie cutters, maybe there's someone in your life who's a nerd just like us, and you should give them a Patreon subscription as a gift for the holidays. So exciting news, our podcast is two years old. That's crazy. I can't believe we're two years old. Well, I mean, technically we were two years old on the last episode, but that electric plane Alice was way too interesting to pass up as a news article. And it tied in so nicely to the Boeing 737 MAX episode that I just couldn't pass that up. But I did want to take some time and talk about all the cool things that we've done over the last year. So instead of the news piece this week, we're going to reflect a little on year two of podcasting. I wanted to start with a little bit of podcasting statistics. These statistics come from Buzzsprout, which is a popular podcast host. It's not the podcast host we use, sorry Buzzsprout, but it's still pretty popular. Some of your podcasts that you listen to probably do some hosting through Buzzsprout. So Buzzsprout notes that the top 10% of podcasts get at least 386 downloads within seven days of an episode release. Our podcast, when we put out a new episode, we're right Around that metric, usually over 386, kind of right over 400 downloads within seven days of an episode being put out. Again, it depends a little bit on the topic, but we're fairly consistently around the 400 downloads in the first week of when a new episode comes out. So that makes us in the top 10% of podcasts, which I think is super cool. That is so cool. Yeah, it's like finally I'm in the top 10% for something and it's not terrible dancing or recorder playing. Also, as you know, I get stuck down rabbit holes of engineering failure research, but I also get down rabbit holes of download statistics. And it's really cool to see who's listening and where they're from. And it's just so exciting when a new country pops up and it's like, oh, hello. Hello, kind stranger. Thank you for listening to our show. So it, it means a lot to us, really. Yeah, we're we're somehow doing super well in Ireland. I have no idea why or how, but we're crushing it in Ireland. For what it's worth, Ireland loves us, but I love them back just as much. I really like Ireland. I've been there twice. It's a beautiful country and everyone is so nice. It's a great place. You should go. I, I have actually not been to Ireland, despite having a very Irish last name. I have not been to Ireland, so... I will put it on the long list of places I need to travel. Fortunately, due to the way that my job schedule works and the structure of the company, I can't really travel unless it's the winter months in North America, which means that it's the winter months over in Ireland. So it might be a little tricky for me to travel to Ireland when the weather is nice, but I'm going to make an attempt. Going to make an attempt. Maybe it'll happen one day. So whether you've been with us from the start or you're just joining us or somewhere in the middle, Again, as always, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your support. You guys keep us going. Without people downloading this podcast, it's just Nicole and I talking to each other about failures that one of us or both of us find interesting, and that's no fun for anyone else. Also, we can do that without recording it and editing it and publishing it. We can just go have a beer and chat about failures. So 
you guys are really the reason that we come back here to record over and over again and put in all this work because we're just really, really happy that you guys are supporting our show. I don't know how to say that more. Uh, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but I, I sincerely mean everything that I'm saying. It's so exciting. I think my favorite part is meeting people in the wild that listen to the show. So going to a meeting or a site visit and I meet someone and they're like, oh, I listened to this episode of yours the other day. And I was like, what? How did you find us? You know about our show? Oh my God, tell me everything. And they're like, uh, you know, it was good. It was good. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So in addition to the cool things we've accomplished with the show itself, the podcast also opened some really cool doors for me in 2022 that I was not expecting. I would say first and foremost, my confidence and comfort level with public speaking has significantly improved, as well as my ability to tackle new and interesting projects that I may not have done before. I've said this to a number of friends, but often to my detriment, I approach every problem with a how hard can it be attitude. I mean, we made a podcast from scratch. We can do anything. Look out world, here we come. Also, I mentioned I went to Ireland. I went there to speak at a conference in September about failure, and I talked quite a bit more about that in the last episode because the Boeing 737 MAX was one of the failures that I talked about in my session. So if you want to hear more about that, go back and listen to the last episode. And I spoke at the Building Commissioning Association's annual conference in September in Phoenix, which was really cool. I am currently president-elect for the Western Canada chapter of the BCA. So I will be taking over as president for our chapter come January, which is really exciting and a new adventure for me. So September was a busy, busy month conference season for me, but um, I'm back home and relaxing and getting ready for the snow, snow to come. Last but not least, and this is probably the biggest news, I quit my job in July and I started my own engineering firm with a colleague of mine, Jay. Hi, Jay. And that has been a really exciting adventure. I love working and I really do. And hard work has never scared me. But for the first time, I feel like I'm in control of what I'm working on and how I get to tackle the problems in front of me, almost like I'm in charge of my own destiny, which is really exciting. And it's been a really empowering experience. And I'm so happy that we took that leap. So that's me, Brian. It's been a busy year for me. Uh, what have you been up to? Thanks to this podcast, I got to talk about one of my favorite things uh, with lots of other people, um, and that's airplanes. Before I joined the podcast with Nicole, um, I think Nicole had done one, possibly two um, airplane episodes. We have obviously spoken a lot more about airplanes on this podcast. I've been here for about a year and a half on the podcast. And I think in that time, we've probably done six or seven airplane episodes. There are more airplane episodes to come. So that's great. Like I said, airplanes are one of my favorite things to talk about, um, whether I know about that topic or whether I could listen to somebody talking about airplanes that I don't know about or a certain facet of airplanes that I don't know about. I always find airplanes really, really interesting and really exciting. Like Nicole, I also got to speak at a couple conferences in a little bit different capacity. One of my favorite ones that I spoke at this year was in Banff, which is a world-class town that's just west of where we live in Calgary. Most of you, if you haven't traveled there, you probably know it from the mountains. It's got Banff National Park, it's got some great mountains, it's got phenomenal skiing, it's got some pretty good restaurants, some great hotels. And I was lucky enough to speak at the North 51 conference as part of their, as part of their panel debates, um, where I got to argue against the merits about artificial intelligence um, in society. And um, I feel partly as a result of this podcast, and uh, at least five horrible puns that I made, I was able to uh, soundly crush my debate opponent by the only metric that actually matters, which is audience applause. And uh, it was a resounding win. And I think without this podcast, I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to debate at that level and certainly not make a bunch of terrible puns. <laughs> the other thing I've learned a lot from this podcast over the last year and a bit that I've been here um, in the last two years, I guess, that I've been listening to it, is how passionate Nicole is about fire system design. It was something that I was aware of in the background. I knew what fire sprinklers were and what they were supposed to do, but I didn't know all the all the ins and outs about 
fire sprinklers and fire system design and the importance of it and why things are designed the way they are and really how important fire systems are in buildings. I, I didn't realize that there were so many building related failures or it's not building related failures, but incidents where people lost their lives due to not having a proper fire sprinkler system or a poorly designed fire sprinkler system. So yeah, without this podcast, I certainly wouldn't know all of these things. Yeah, I am fascinated by fire design. I don't really even know why or what it is about it. I just know that if it's in front of me, I don't want to stop reading. So uh, these episodes, you know, the the one we're doing today, the Station Nightclub Fire and all of the ones like it are just so interesting to me. And I think the thing that I learned from these, and we're going to talk about this uh, in a second here when we get into the the failure itself. But one of the things that I find so interesting is it's it's actually not just about the fire protection system. So I used to think it was a matter of whether or not you had sprinklers. And that is definitely a big part of it. But there's so many other factors that aren't even related to the sprinkler system, such as exiting or building construction, what the materials it's made of, or other materials that were put in the building later, which is a big part of the one we're going to talk about today, or even access to fire extinguishers or training of the staff and how to use them. All of these things compound on each other to lead to these catastrophic events. And I just find it so interesting. And I guess the part that I find weird is they're so tragic. These stories are so sad and I don't enjoy that part of it, but I just find the technical piece of fire protection design to be just so interesting. And I think the other thing that I like about it too is it's a collaboration. Fire protection is not a standalone discipline really at its heart. It it takes a bit of everyone working together. You've got the architect picking materials and designing the layout of the space. You've got the electrical engineer who's dealing with the fire protection system. You've got the structural engineer who needs to make sure the building stays standing. And you've got the mechanical engineer who's providing water and in some cases, the fire protection design. And and in other cases, you've got a separate sprinkler engineer who's doing that design. So it really does take a group effort to make these buildings safe. And I do enjoy collaborating in my in my role. And I think that's why construction has been such a great industry for me because I'm not working in a silo. I get to work with everybody and I get to talk to everybody about all the cool things that they're doing. So anyways, I could talk about this for probably a very long time. So maybe we should get into the failure. Not satisfied with buzzing your hair? Don't want to pay the price of an excellent Clips haircut? When you want a mediocre haircut for a mediocre price, Mediocre Clips is your out of bathroom haircutting destination. Same burnt out light bulbs as your bathroom, but our stylists have slightly more hair trimming experience than you do. Mediocre Clips, when okay is good enough. Now onto this week's engineering failure, the Station Nightclub Fire. The Station Nightclub Fire happened on February 20th, 2003 at 11.07 p.m. Eastern Time in West Warwick, Rhode Island. The cause of this fire was pyrotechnics set off by a tour manager for that evening's headlining band, Great White. So the pyrotechnics ignited flammable acoustic foam in the walls and ceiling around the stage. It only took a minute. It's one minute, 60 seconds, about the time that you sit at a standard stoplight for this to reach flashover, which is the almost simultaneous ignition of exposed combustibles in the vicinity of the fire. Within two minutes, thick black smoke engulfed the entire club. Between the smoke, unfamiliarity with the building, and blocked exits, getting out of the building was a challenge. It didn't help that the fans thought that the fire was part of the show, until the band stopped playing and the lead singer said over the mic, wow, that's not good. The fire resulted in 100 deaths and there were 230 people injured. So the Station Nightclub fire was the fourth deadliest fire at a U.S. nightclub and the second deadliest in New England after the 1942 Coconut Grove fire that killed 492 people, which is a lot and very tragic. We cover Coconut Grove in a mini failure, uh, episode 21, 
mini failure episode 21 on our Patreon feed. The Coconut Grove fire was quite old. It's from the 1940s and information was a bit harder to find. And also on top of that, the Coconut Grove fire, it was extensive and it did drive some change in fire protection and life safety. But I think because the station nightclub was so recent, at least my perception is that it had a much larger impact on fire safety to at least today. And so I thought that it was more relevant to current buildings. And so that's why we're covering it on a regular episode instead of a mini failure. Also, I didn't know this until I started researching this fire. The E2 nightclub stampede in Chicago happened three days before. And in that instance, a security guard used pepper spray to break up a fight, ensuing panic, which resulted in 21 deaths and 50 injuries, which sounds a nightclub stampede sounds very intense. And so relevant to the fire, because of that E2 nightclub stampede in Chicago, there was a news crew at the station nightclub on the night of the fire reporting on safety, which is ironic. The silver lining of this was that they caught the entire fire on camera and you can watch it on YouTube and see just how fast it spread. And it is fast. The whole video, which has the entire story, I think is seven minutes. And it includes the video from the news crew. And you see everyone kind of slowly trying to back out of the building. I, I think one of the contributing things for this, and, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, um, when you go to a band show like this, you expect pyrotechnics to be a part of the show. And they certainly were part of the show. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable for people to not react in a typical manner. If you're in a house or a, you know, an office building and something's on fire, like that's not what you expect to be happening there. Where if you go to a rock and roll show, pyrotechnics are kind of part and parcel of going to a rock and roll show. So I feel that contributed a lot to these deaths. For sure. For sure. And I'm in no way blaming any of the people who attended the fire. They didn't know. You don't go to a nightclub expecting it to burn down. I, you, they just did the best they could with what they thought was they were seeing in front of them. It's just really tragic how fast it spread because by the time a lot of people realized what was going on, it was almost too late and it was really hard to get out of the building. Just before we leave this E2 nightclub stampede, I do want to talk about pepper spray for a second because I thought this was interesting. So pepper spray is considered a weapon in Canada and is therefore illegal unless not quite the same, but you are allowed to purchase bear spray in order to not get eaten by a bear. And that's pretty common. I have bear spray that I take with me hiking. I believe Brian does as well. I, I do have bear spray. I take hiking. But pepper spray is legal in Illinois, which which I didn't realize. That's why I had, look, I had looked it up because you can't use pepper spray in Canada. So I was like, oh, I wonder if he was allowed to use it in Illinois or if he had it illegally. And then from there, I jumped to Kinder Surprise, which is illegal in the United States, which I find so interesting. And I'll never understand the Kinder Surprise thing. It doesn't make sense to me. So Americans, if you don't know what Kinder Surprise is, it's a hollow chocolate egg with a little capsule inside. And inside that capsule are all the parts and pieces to make a toy and it's chocolate and it's got a toy. It's delicious and fun and everyone should be able to experience them, but they are in fact illegal in the United States. So I actually do know why they are banned in America. So back in 1938, the U S food and drug cosmetics act banned all candy with non nutritive objects in them. So since the kinder surprise of basically like Nicole said, it's a hollow egg. I don't find the chocolate particularly good. Um, but it does contain a little capsule that has usually pieces for a toy or pieces in a, for a puzzle that you can assemble. Nicole said they're super fun. They're super great. So the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration also claimed that this could be a choking hazard um, for kids. I don't quite see that. I believe there are seven children um, over the history of Kinder Surprise. So they they became a thing in the 1970s. So seven children, I believe, since 1970 or so have died as a result of choking on the little capsule inside of the Kinder Surprise to Kinder Surprise eggs. And there have been billions and billions of Kinder eggs sold. So I feel it's a pretty safe metric for things. 
So just as, a, as an interesting side note, in 2011, um, there were 60,000 kinder eggs that were confiscated at the U.S.-Canada border. And I did read something a while ago, um, I believe it was, was in Seattle, that somebody had four or six eggs in their car that they purchased in Vancouver, B.C., Canada, and then they were crossing back into Washington State. And they were threatened with fines of up to $2,500 U.S. per Kinder Surprise egg. And one of their options was actually just to consume the eggs at the border crossing um, so that they wouldn't have to go through this fine, which is what they wound up doing. Either way, I think it's a little ridiculous, just like Nicole, that Kinder eggs are banned in the USA. If you ever come to Canada or Mexico or anywhere else, basically, that's not the U.S. that sells Kinder eggs, purchase one. They're very fun. I've eaten a number of them. On to the pyrotechnics that were used that night. So when Great White's 1991 hit single Desert Moon started to open their set, their managers set off four devices that are called GURBs. And so anyone that's not familiar with, uh, I guess, pyrotechnics, so these are cylindrical devices that set off a spray or shower of sparks. So two of these were pointed at 45 degree angles towards the upper corners of the front of the stage, and two were pointed straight up. It seems like a fairly common setup for things, fairly common pyrotechnic setup for a show in the early 90s. So like we mentioned, these GURBs set off some acoustic foam, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And the fire was actually, as Nicole mentioned, it was caught on video. And from the video, you can see the sparks and how quickly the fire and the smoke start. So it's somewhat hard to tell from the video, but it looks like the sparks are hitting the acoustic foam. And also of note, the stage in the building, they're pretty small. So there were 462 people in attendance at this concert, and the club's license capacity was 404. So not a very big venue. Also not a ton of people there. Like in the grand scheme of things, 462 people for a concert is not a lot of people. Um, I realize they were over capacity in the venue. Either way, this is probably a little bit too small to have four spark showers. So it's not really a surprise the building caught on fire, acoustic foam or not. The other thing that works against this building is it was fairly old. This building was built in 1946, and it was built as a wooden framed building. Despite the club undergoing many renovations over the years, it had remained grandfathered into an exception for laws requiring ceiling sprinklers. So for anyone that's not familiar with grandfathering clauses, as safety advances come in and legislation changes, um, if you want to build a new building, you have to comply with the new legislation. When stuff gets grandfathered in, it, it basically just allows existing operation to continue legally when if you tried to build that same building, it would be illegal and your permit probably wouldn't get approved. So since the building was old and not undergoing extensive renovations, it was allowed to remain under the codes that were in place when it was built. So to me, it was really only a matter of time before something like this happened. But the sparks, even though they were the cause, really are just the tip of the iceberg here. The second biggest contributing factor to this fire was the acoustic foam that surrounded the stage. So the foam was built in two layers, the outer layer being a highly flammable urethane foam with a harder to ignite but high heat producing, once ignited, polyethylene foam underneath. It was the outer layer that caught fire first and spread quickly, lighting the second layer, which produced a very toxic, opaque, dark smoke. And that smoke released carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide gas. And it's said that inhaling this smoke two to three times is enough to knock someone unconscious. And unfortunately, they will likely die shortly after unless they're rescued, which I think was also why there were so many deaths in this fire, because the, the smoke itself was so toxic and it spread so quickly. The next contributing factor were the exits. So as mentioned, the smoke started quickly and visibility was really limited. Because of that, people, you know, people panic. I don't do great in an emergency. I get it. And they didn't really know where all the exits were. So most people headed back the way they came in, which was the front door. And I don't blame them. That's probably what I would do. But the main entrance was a narrow corridor with an intermediate door and small foyer to prevent people from entering without tickets. And we've seen this before. This happened at Coconut Grove. People getting in for free is of more concern to owners and managers than people's ability to exit in an emergency. 
And so because of this narrow corridor, it got really, really crowded really, really fast. And several survivors had injuries of burns, smoke inhalation, thermal trauma, or crushing trying to escape. And I, I've certainly been to a lot of concerts. I know Brian has as well. And if you've ever been at the front of a standing room concert and everyone starts pushing when the band comes on and you get pushed up against the rail, not a great feeling. And this would easily be a thousand times worse. On top of that, several survivors said that the bouncer at the exit next to the stage wouldn't let people escape through that door because it was, quote, for the band only, which is a really big jerk move that that bouncer will have to live with for the rest of his life. I, I realize that, you know, 99% of the time, you know, it's for the band only and people shouldn't be going, you know, back to green rooms where the band is. But if stuff's on fire, I feel you can probably drop the for the band only requirement and let some people out to go that way. Um, one of the other things, like Nicole said, I've gone to probably thousands of concerts in my life. A lot of them are punk rock shows. One of the things that I always do whenever I go to a venue, um, and maybe it's because I'm old now, but I've been doing this for quite a while, I always find where the nearest exit is and then also where the next closest exit is, just in case something does happen, you know, whatever the incident is, whether it's, you know, a fire-related thing or there's smoke or... I mean, we're in Canada, so, you know, gun violence isn't really a thing. But if there's any reason that I need to leave a venue in a hurry, I want to know where the exits are. I don't want to be spending time looking around trying to find an exit. If the power goes out, it makes it even harder to find exits. The exit sign should still run off backup power, but there are some venues that aren't maintained as well as what they should be. So my public service announcement for this episode is look for the nearest exit and the alternative exit whenever you go to a venue. It may save your life someday. Great advice. Yes. So last contributing factor we want to talk about, though, is the building itself. So like I mentioned, the building itself is almost 60 years old at the time that this concert is happening. Um, so the building, it contributed 95% of the fuel load for the fire. So even though the panels started it, they were less than 5% of the fuel in this fire. And as we mentioned, this building built in 1946, it was made out of wood and had been able to really skirt around some important life safety upgrades like installing sprinklers. It only took five minutes for the entire building to be engulfed in flames. Like five minutes, 300 seconds. I'm pretty sure I've sat at red lights for longer times than that. Like five minutes is... I'm going to say about the amount of time that you spend in line at Starbucks or whatever your favorite coffee establishment is waiting to get coffee. Like that's not a really long time when you think about it. It's also a terrifyingly long time if you're in a building that's on fire. Yeah, this this one, when I was reading about it, really reminded me of the Luna Park ghost train fire that we covered in episode 52, which was back in June. That fire also spread really quick, really old building. A lot of flammable things were added to it. And when you look at the aftermath of really both buildings, they're just completely collapsed on the ground, just ravaged with fire and very tragic, very bo in both cases. Uh, there was actually a lot of similarities between the two fires, which I thought was interesting and unfortunate because... I'd love it if we could learn from some of our mistakes and not repeat them, but here we are. Actually, I do think we learn from a lot of mistakes that we've covered on this show. It's just we probably don't hear about them because they don't make it to the stage of failure. Or, you know, there's not a catastrophic fire that we would have a, a news article or something to go off of to, to build an episode for this show. So I'm going to be optimistic and say that there's been a lot of learning that has happened from all these failures that we've covered. No, that's a great point. You're right that I shouldn't be so negative. There's a lot of failures that are likely avoided that we just don't know about. And and I'm really only focusing on the failures that aren't avoided because we didn't see the signs coming. But that is really just a small fraction of of all the potential failures that could occur. So the site of the fire was cleared and a makeshift memorial took place at the site. The land was donated to the Station Fire Memorial Foundation in 2016, and the memorial dedication ceremony took place on May 21st, 2017. 
So we are going to talk a little bit about the code changes that happened as a result of this fire. But before that, I do want to talk about consequences for the band manager who lit those spark shower gerbs and the club owners because I was definitely curious what happened to them. So I'm sure you all are as well. Big shocker here. I mean, that sarcastically, there was a disagreement over whether or not the band had permission to use pyrotechnics that night. And I want to say that even if they didn't have permission, the owner should have seen them setting up these gerbs, the spark shower things. But I, I did some online research and I, I want to report back. They're pretty small and it's possible that they weren't noticed ahead of time. Just as a, as a note for, for things like this, for pyrotechnics, this is typically spelled out in the band's rider for what they're doing at a venue, or it would be explicitly stated in any sort of agreement that you're signing with the venue. Any of the riders I've looked at or agreements with venues, they've been fairly explicit on what you can do and what you can't do. So I'm actually kind of surprised that there isn't anything in here for whether they could use pyrotechnics or not. And again, with this being a building that was built in 1946, the, I feel the owner should have been very aware of the age of the building and the fact that, you know, there was, you know, it was wood framed and it would have a much higher combustible potential than something that was built in the last couple of years that would have been, you know, possibly cinder block or had newer, you know, less flammable materials. That's a great point. I have never read a rider as you call them. So I, that to completely makes sense that there's a contract between the band and the venue. I, just from what I read, yeah, there was a disagreement over whether or not they had permission. And and we don't really know, rider or not, we don't really know what the case was and whether or not they had permission. And at the end of the day, they were all held responsible. So I feel like that's a small piece of the argument. It's not like someone got released from liability because of that. They They all ended up taking responsibility for the fire. As a result of this, the band manager pleaded guilty against his lawyer's advice to 100 counts of involuntary manslaughter on February the 7th, 2006. So he said he wanted to bring peace, I want this to be over, and he was sentenced to four years in prison and three years probation. He ended up being released early in March 2008 with parole ending in March 2011. Many of the families forgave him and supported his parole, noting that he stood up, admitted responsibility, made no attempt to mitigate guilt, and apologized to the families, even writing handwritten letters to the families of each of the 100 victims. The nightclub was owned by two brothers, and six months after the band manager pleaded guilty, the owners changed their pleas from not guilty to no contest, avoiding a trial. One was sentenced to four years in prison and three years probation, which is the same as the band manager, and the other was sentenced to 500 hours of community service. The different sentences were in relation to their role in purchasing and installing a flammable phone. The brother who received prison time was released on good behavior in June of 2009. As of September 2009, $115 million U.S. million in settlements were paid to the victims and their families, and these included $1 million from the band's insurance plan, $813,000 from the club owner's insurance plan, the state of Rhode Island paid $10 million, the acoustic foam manufacturer paid $25 million. The company that sold the insulation paid $6.3 million. The installers paid $5 million. The manufacturer of the speakers, which allegedly used flammable foam inside, paid $815,000. A beer distributor offered $21 million, which I'm not quite sure if it is related to some fault or just in support of the victims. And lastly, the news crew on site paid $30 million because it was claimed their video journalist was obstructing the exit. I gotta say, I'm actually impressed with how large the settlements are for this fire. I was not expecting to see $115 million. And I'm sure the victims and their families are saying it's nowhere near enough, and, and I get that. But there's still a lot of people stepped up. I mean, it has been almost 20 years, and so we're seeing outcome of a long battle. But $115 million is is a substantial amount of money, and I'm I'm actually kind of, I'm happy to see that there was some ownership taken and some of these parties were, at least an attempt was 
was made to make them whole. They'll, they'll never be the same. These people's lives are changed forever. But there was at least some type of compensation. I mean, it's something. As we've mentioned several times, the fire was really tragic and completely preventable. And we talk about this all the time. And also, like we've talked about many times before, humans are much more reactive than proactive. And this fire was exactly the kick in the butt that regulators needed to crack down on life safety in assembly occupancies. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology conducted an investigation under the authority of the National Construction Safety Team Act using fire dynamics simulator software and a mock-up of the fire. They concluded that a sprinkler system would have held the fire at bay for long enough to get everyone out of the building safely. The building, again constructed in 1946, was under 4,500 square feet or 417 square meters and was grandfathered from the upgrade requirements to include and install a working sprinkler system. And this is fairly common. A building usually has to go under an extensive enough renovation to trigger all aspects of the building to be upgraded to current codes. Some jurisdictions do it based on how much square footage is being renovated. Some of them go, I think, based on cost of the renovation. And then other ones have other factors that they look at to determine what that benchmark is for whether or not you're grandfathered. This is something that comes up in renovation projects when they're planning out what kind of work they're going to do because they it's not cheap to upgrade buildings to current codes. And so they have to plan for that in their budget if they're going to trigger those upgrades. The thing is on this one that the station nightclub went under a change of use, which voided the grandfathering. So they, while they were grandfathered in in practice, they weren't actually grandfathered legally and they should have upgraded the building and put in a sprinkler system. But unfortunately, the fire inspectors missed this. So on the night of the fire, the building was legally required to have sprinklers, but it was just never enforced, which is really unfortunate. After the fire, the grandfathering clause, which allowed buildings constructed before 1976 to forego ceiling sprinklers, that was finally lifted. And so this meant that all public facilities over a certain capacity were now forced to upgrade and install a sprinkler system. Specifically, Group A2 occupancies, which are assemblies intended for food and or drink consumption, including things like banquet halls, casinos, nightclubs, restaurants, cafeterias, etc., 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 and now had to install sprinklers if the capacity was over 100. The threshold used to be 300, so that was lowered from 300 now to 100. After learning about the station nightclub fire, there was very little opposition to this change to the code. And a lot of people, including restaurants, were on board with this change. And a lot of people supported this change and were willing to upgrade their buildings. I think, at least in Canada, there's also grants and other different funding, depending on the type of building you have and, and the type of renovation and upgrade you need to offset some of those costs. I don't think that would necessarily apply to a nightclub, although I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure also what it looks like in the States, but there are incentives in place to help building owners make these life safety upgrades. Regulations for pyrotechnic displays were also tightened and strictly enforced. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, who did that initial investigation, also released a two-volume report, including recommendations restricting flammable foam plastic materials, prohibiting pyrotechnic displays in enclosed nightclubs without sprinklers, giving local fire marshals more power to enforce codes and standards, which is honestly a huge move to give those fire marshals the ability to close buildings and issue fines when the rules aren't being followed. That's, I think that makes a huge difference. And also making sprinkler requirements stronger by increasing the factor of safety on time for occupants to exit. So life safety standards are often referred to in a in minutes or hours of time that a material or assembly can hold back a fire and allow occupants to safely exit. So when someone talks about a one hour wall, they're referring to a wall that can resist fire exposure for one hour. And I'm using one hour because it's probably one of the most common in my experience. 
The most I've seen is a four hour wall, which usually separates different occupancy types, very different occupancy types. To throw a wrench in things, there's also a zero hour wall, which is a smoke separation that prevents smoke from transferring from one space to another. I just thought that was interesting. And we've included a link to the report in the sources on the webpage for this episode at failurology.ca. So if you want to see the National Institute of Standards and Technologies two-volume report, we'll warn you, it's very long. If you want to check that out, head to our website. So there you have it, the Station Nightclub Fire, a completely preventable and devastating fire that changed the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people in under two minutes. We've seen this before, and unfortunately, we will probably see it again and probably talk about it again on this podcast. How many of these tragic fires will there be before we get our ducks in a row and strengthen life safety systems in existing buildings? For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failurology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failurology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at Failurology. You can email us at thefailurologypodcast at gmail.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, or you can message us on our Patreon page. Check out the show notes for links to all of these, and thank you again to everyone for listening. Tune into the next episode where we're going to talk about the time that the regulatory body for Quebec engineers had its powers of self-regulation revoked. We'll also talk about some of the history of engineering as a profession in Canada and specifically in Alberta. Bye everyone. Talk soon. Mm -hmm.